aloha, Hawaii. Welcome back to our show. We are the voice for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host, Barbara DeLuca, founder and president, and my co-host is Marisol Ruiz, our co-founder and vice president. Today's guest is Iris Mendoza, or Iris. <laughs> she <laughs> is a language access coordinator for HCIR. That's the Hawaii Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Welcome to our show, Iris. Thank you for having me here. I'm super excited. Thank you. Of course, you're welcome. Why don't you tell us about yourself, your family background, <laughs> and how you ended up in this role? <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to your show. It's super exciting for me to connect with the Hispanic community here on a walk of a year last year and this year, just kind of finding, you know, um, the Hispanic community after moving here from California four years ago. Um, so. Uh, a little bit about myself is um, I'm originally from Orange County, California, Huntington Beach, um, but I've been coming back and forth to Oahu specifically and other islands in Hawaii for about 11 years just to visit family, um, visit friends. Um, but I was born and raised over there. So eventually during one of my trips, I met my husband. <laughs> so um ended up staying here. He is native Hawaiian. So it's really important for him to stay on the island as someone that was born and raised here, you know, not being displaced from his, um, basically his homeland. So, um, I made that this, we both made the decision of staying here as long as we can. Um, so I'm here now, but, um, as I transitioned from California to Hawaii, I always lived close to the beach. So that was kind of like the common thing I had with, um, Hawaii, but it was kind of culture shock for me. Um, you know, be, not seeing so many Latinos at first, uh, not really experiencing that sense of having my family here, um, not knowing where to go for good Mexican food. <laughs> so it was kind of a big shock for me um, with when it came to my culture. Um, at the same time, I was embracing the Hawaiian culture head on, kind of going to a lot of uh, culture events um, with my husband, but I felt like something was missing. So. Um, during my time here, when I moved um, to Hawaii, I was still, I was actually working in a corporate setting for a big company in um, California, um, kind of, it, I was the underwriter, so for insurance, um, and kind of underwriting multi-million dollar homes, completely different than um, what I'm doing now. So, um, <laughs> so from going from that um uh, Kind of living here and then still working remotely in that organ um, that corporation, I realized, hey, um, my heart wasn't all there anymore. I realized like I want to do something a little bit more fulfilling where I'm actually helping people because my actual passion in life is to kind of advocate for people that are like my parents. Um, their first, you know, um, they're immigrants that came from Mexico, and my dad was one of those people that um, he actually got citizenship through the amnesty. Um, he worked, he worked in the fields in California, all over NorCal. And he kind of, he ran from, from ice, basically everything. So I know that he faced a lot of struggles with language access, um, you know, being able to, uh, find resources for himself. So, um, you know, and then me growing up being their interpreter, it's kind of like, I want other people that are like me that grew up. I want them to understand that, Hey, you're not alone. There's like a big sister. Um, I guess I would consider myself the big sister now um, that can help you help your parents. <laughs> so you're the auntie. Yeah, like the auntie, big sister, just here trying to help our community kind of rise up and know that they're not alone, feel a sense of belonging in Hawaii, of course, remaining respectful, you know, to our native Hawaiian brothers and sisters. I think you and Marisol have a lot uh, in common as far as your. your pathway and I know I'm like listening I'm listening to you and I'm like everything you're saying is we're like sisters but you know that's the that's a common uh, story with so many uh, first generation Americans right is um our I don't know if it's always our nature but we evolve to become I think these people uh where you want to help others and you want to advocate because that kind of becomes your role from being really really young um, and it just is what it is. Right. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's great because we're helping our families, but you know, sometimes my sister and I sit, sit down and 
we kind of look back at, you know, childhood and, and we have this conversation and it's like, wow, it was such a, a burden uh, to carry without realizing that, right? Huge responsibility, knowing about things that sometimes children shouldn't know about or translating things that yeah. are just way more, you know, beyond a scope that, a, a, like, at least in my case for a child, um, just too, too much responsibility, right? But it kind of forces you to, to step up when you don't, you don't know any better, right? And then you do, you find yourself in these roles where, you know, you go from, you know, insurance and you know that there's something that's more fulfilling because you see and you've lived uh, mm -hmm. with, with people that had have needed that kind of help. And I mean, my experience is similar. My mother, I'm first generation American as well. Uh, my father immigrated from uh, Mexico and my mother from El Salvador. And then I was born in LA and the exact, exact same thing, you know, and they did all of the, um, you know, working, yeah. uh, you know, and <laughs> anyways, but yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I can tell you definitely relate. It's, you know, it's a very common story within our community. It is. And, 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 you know, what's interesting too, I mean, uh, one of the things we don't, I don't think our, give ourselves credit enough also for our accomplishments and accolades and things that we do, because it seems like it's expected and it's almost normal and it's what we should be doing. You know, I sat at this round table and, and they were saying, you know, talk about yourself, say some, you know, great things. And this one wonderful lady, she was, you know, she's saying I'm first generation American. I'm the first to go to college. I'm the first. And I was like, me too, me too, in my head, right? But I didn't even think to talk about these things because to me, it seems like, I don't know, it's almost ex expected, right? But um, yeah. yeah, I can totally relate to you. I think it's it's awesome. But how do you make that transition from doing something corporate and, you know, an insurance underwriter to something that is more service uh, oriented? I mean, that's a big, that's a big jump, I think, right? So how does that transition even occur? How does that opportunity come up? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course, yes. Um, so the way, basically the transition happened after um, the Maui wildfires. Um, so August 8th, which ironically is also the day I got married. Um, so after that, I realized like that, you know, I noticed that there was a lot of pages on Instagram um, of Latinos in Maui um, asking for help. They were saying that they didn't understand the language that a lot of the um, that the resources that were coming, like for example, FEMA, Red Cross, a lot of it was not in language. So I remember kind of going through a lot of Instagram pages and just kind of, it, it, I just compelled to me, like I, I needed to, I needed to help in a way, but I just didn't know how. Um, so I remember finding Pacific Gateway Center's Instagram um, and they had an, a job opening for a Spanish, a bilingual Spanish Pukua navigator for a hotline that they were opening for our, basically all immigrant communities. So um, the hotline serves Chupis, Marshallese, um, Ilocano, Tagalog, Tongan, Spanish. Um, so I remember seeing the job opening and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to jump on it. I don't know if it's something I can do right now, but I'm going to commit myself to it. So. I spoke to Tarina Wong. She's amazing. And um, she brought me on board and I started working on that hotline um, from home, just answering phone calls from fire victims that spoke Spanish. Um, so that's how I transitioned kind of into this, this field, just um, working for a non basically from cor corporate to nonprofit was through that hotline. And through that hotline, I actually was introduced to Liza, which, um, she is the director of the Hawaii Coalition for Immigrant Rights. And then um, a few months later, um, you know, we collaborated. She interviewed me and she brought me on as the language access coordinator um, for them. Um, it was definitely not an easy transition. Let's just say that. Because usually when it comes to working as an underwriter, you can just turn off your work. After, after you're done, you can just clock out and it's done. Um, you don't have to worry about it till the next day. Um, with this type of work, um, I would stay up at night all the time trying to balance the, that transition, um, just kind of um, figuring out, hey, how can I help this person that called on the hotline? His whole family passed away. You know, what can I do for him? What kind of resources can I offer him? Um, and he doesn't speak English. And a lot of this information is not in language. What can we do? So um, working on the hotline, um, the Immigration Resource Center uh, multilingual hotline 
and working with the coalition, we were kind of able to collaborate ideas on ways to help, um, things to do. But um, it was definitely not an easy transition, transition, but it was very fulfilling. Uh, just being able to help and just hearing the, the the relief that people got once they called and they would say, hablas español? And I'm like, sí, claro, hablo español. And after their whole life, you know, got taken from them, they're, they either lost um, their homes or they lost kids. And then for them to hear like, sí, yo hablo español, señor, yo soy de México. How can I help you? You know, you, they would be in tears. They're yes. like, oh my gosh, yo soy inmigrante. I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican. I don't, I, you know, I, I'm scared. We, I, I don't have, you know, documents. I don't know what to do. So this is the amazing thing about the hotline. It's just a safe space. So, um, you know, we were able to offer resources, kind of refer them to those resources without fear. And then we were able to serve as, as the people that, you know, would kind of first contact those resources to see if they were in danger of, you know, any type of, um, legal repercussion because of their legal status. So really fulfilling. It's just um, a hard transition. I feel a lot better now <laughs> getting used to it. Do you what? feel, oh, do you sorry. feel that, um, I mean, I, I, and I'm only speaking from like real personal experience, like just with my family and my mother, like, I mean, we wouldn't even go to the doctors. Like I remember I was literally yeah. like, my appendix was going to like blow out. Of me. It's and, and it was like, I took every remedy, tea, seven up, spray, like everything, right? except going to, <laughs> except going to the hospital because we're under the radar. Well, they were under the radar, right? Oh yeah. Um, so there was this, this inherent fear of just li- keeping a low profile. Don't ruffle any feathers. Don't expose yourself, you know? So in a situation like this, how do you, those that are bold enough to call or even know that this, you know, this resource is available and this information, you know, they're bold enough to take that action. How do you find, and how do you know where there's so many others I can imagine that, that weren't bold and that are, are still maybe laying low for that fear of potential deportation. So how do you, how, how do you communicate that, that, like you said, you know, it's a safe space, right? But how do you really truly convey that? And how do you reach those those other the other people like I can't I can't imagine can you talk a little bit about that of course yes so it takes a lot of courage for people to call um like you said it's taking that first step but the main the the way that we were able to gain people to call was word of mouth um it first starts with establishing trust with the people that called so whether it was like a tío that called um you know or a, an auntie calling um just kind of letting her know right right off the bat hey I know you're scared to call we're really thankful that you called. Uh, we want to let you know that we will not disclose your information. Um, and we're here to help you. And all the information that you give us today, it's not recorded. It's a safe space. And kind of laying that out for them. And then um, the main way is word of mouth. They would spread the word to other people. Um, because, of course, you know, in our community, in our Hispanic community, um, a lot of times people that are, um, that come uh, straight from Mexico, other Latin American countries, they don't know how to use technology that well. So um, we couldn't rely solely on technology. So it was mostly letting them know, hey, can you please? Yeah, coconut wireless. Yes. Just letting them know to refer us. And then another way that we were able to get the word out um, for the hotline and for them to call us and and not just to the Hispanic community. um, It was um, it was basically going to the Lahaina ourselves and going to these communities, identifying grassroots organizations, um, such as Roots Reborn. They're amazing. Uh, Veronica is someone that's a powerhouse out there helping our community. So identifying organizations and working with them as a coalition and trying to give them those resources, um, give them in, in language flyers for them to be able to hand out to the communities that they built trust with. Um, so that's the, the main way we had to do it ourselves because, um, it wasn't being advertised on t- television. Um, we asked a lot of um, government agencies for help. And unfortunately, the lag was way too big. So we had to do it ourselves. And we flew out to Lahaina countless times to go to the hotels and identify um, LEP communities and just give them flyers in every language. When you say LEP, what does that mean? Limited English um, proficiency. Uh, so basically, they don't speak English. So okay. we 
yeah, we identified them in the hotels. We actually went to hotel about four hotels and we passed out flyers. Um, and we actually generated some calls for the hotline that way as well. Sounds like trust, trust, um, understandably is a huge issue. Would you, would you say, are there any other concerning things that you saw happening, um, in the, the uh, LEP community in Lahaina after the wildfire? Yes. So, um, I think the need for language access is imperative, especially to have a blueprint in Hawaii. It's it's already the law. It's just the thing is it's not being implemented correctly. Um, right. So just the coalition, we're advocating for language access. Again, even though we shouldn't have to because it's already the law, right. um, we noticed a huge lag um, for the LEP community Um Basically, when it came to resources from FEMA, any any resources basically that were given to uh, wildfire survivors in Maui, um, a lot of it was not in the languages that um, people could understand. So a lot of the people didn't, you know, they weren't able to apply for these um, resources by the deadlines. So then it was up to us to kind of try to get extensions for them, try to help them um, having resource fairs for them to basically come in and have have interpreters there so i think the biggest problem was the lack of language access um within our community especially in disasters uh we did um we did one of the days where we went to canvas hotels uh, myself and the coalition and we did the biggest thing that we found it was super alarming was um so what triggered me going over there was i we i noticed that i was getting a lot of calls from Latinos saying that, hey, where can we get free food? We're staying at at the hotels that are paid for by FEMA and the Red Cross. And then I said, hey, you guys should be getting free food at the hotels. What's going on? And then they were saying that they didn't have food. They didn't have money for food. So what we did is we organized the trip out there and we actually went into the cafeterias where the food is supposed to be served. And the food was being served. That wasn't the issue. The, there was plenty of food, but the information was not in language. So um, and the check-in process was not in language, meaning it was not in Spanish. It was not in other languages that people could understand. So when people were checking in, um, there was no kind of written material that said, hey, I, la comida empieza a las tres de la tarde. Like the, mm -hmm. they, they didn't, they, it didn't give a schedule of free food, when the food started, nothing. Or so, if it was um, free. They see people or if it eat, was free. They're like, yeah. you know, do we have to pay for it? There's so many questions that, Exactly. Answered. So, exactly. So that was not in language. So that was really hard to see because I know for a fact that there was people in that hotel that were hungry. Um, and we spoke to multiple people. Um, us, the coalition, were very, very persistent on pushing um, people to get answers. So we actually went over to um, Red Cross and we said, "Hey, what's going on with the check-in process? What's going on? We these people need to have in language." materials to tell them when the food is being served because we're getting calls on Oahu saying that they're hungry. So um we try to coordinate with them several times. It's just again, it's a lot of advocacy that we have to do because they are not basically they we're still it, just sadly we're still working on communicating with them so we can get them those pamphlets in language. So they still right. haven't been responsive. Yeah. It's creating those um, strategic partnerships with the other organizations, the Red Cross and um, FEMA. So you're all on the same page, right? It's, it sounds like when the FBI comes in and takes over yeah. a police investigation, like, okay, move over, we're here. <laughs> yep. but, yeah, you need to have um, be on the same page, especially, like you said, it's the law. So it's not a privilege, it's a right. Yeah, no, and that's, it's true. Language access is definitely not a privilege <laughs> um it's all right so we we're advocating for that because um if there's no language access especially during emergency situations people can lose their lives they can lose their entire livelihood and it mm -hmm. can ruin their lives and a lot of people were kind of pushing back saying oh well this is you know you know there's always that argument this is america they have to speak you know whether it's spanish or they have to speak English. They're not just talking about the Latino community. People are talking about like Filipino, other, you know, other communities. So um, we understand. Yeah, there is no yeah. official language. So it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing to be able to speak two languages. Exactly. So I, I think, you know, right now, our biggest um, priority is to push for language access. 
um, just because we saw how devastating it was to um, our communities, you know, um, whether it was Marshallese communities, uh, Filipino community, Hispanic community, a lot of a lot of our people fell through the cracks. And um, it was really hard to see that just because the, the you know, just because the resources were not in Spanish, translated in Spanish, that they missed out on opportunities to apply for, you know, for for things that they qualified for. I have a question. So when you say two two questions, when you say language access, do you mean primarily like we're trying to translate documents, like make whatever information is there in the respective languages, right? Uh, is that what you mean by language access or, yes. or does it go further? Okay, so like translating, because, you know, when I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm listening and it's a little heartbreaking because um, it, everything is in inf is information, right? In any field, he who has the information has the power and the resources can be sitting there for your taking. And if you don't know they're there, it doesn't even matter, right? Exactly. So you're trying to provide that information because the, the stuff's there basically. Am, am I correct? Exactly. Every, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're completely right. All the resources were there. It was just, there was a lag, you know, FEMA did have interpreters, thankful for that, but there wasn't enough of them. Mm -hmm. um, there was interpreters um, available, but there wasn't enough. Um, the lag for, to get a document pushed out and translated took way too long. Um, just kind of put our communities uh, behind. And as you know, with our communities, it's very, um, it's a lot of ha um, hand holding, not because they don't know or they're not smart. It's because it's a whole different culture. Um, a lot of fear goes into it. Um, a lot of trust building. Um, and so, you know, I think moving forward for if I, we, I think with the coalition, we're working on a blueprint for something um, to avoid anything like this happening again. Um, because it's, again, I saw everything um, kind of unfolding and oh my goodness, this wouldn't happen anywhere else. <laughs> it was insane. I have another, the, another part of my question, you know, you had said about um, you could turn off your job when you were, when you were an insurance underwriter <laughs> and you're done. So there's something awesome about that. I get it. But when yeah. you're coming from a space of, of wanting to advocate and, and help people, how are you, have you been handling, I can't, I'm an extraordinarily emotional uh, person. And I mean, you can't tell me a story. I'll start like bawling. Anybody that knows me knows that. Um, so how do you handle a situation like that where I mean, you went from one end of the spectrum to the other where, I mean, you're dealing with disasters and loss of life and, and, and homes. And how have you been able to navigate and deal with that? Because you can't turn it off, right? Your brain mm -hmm. is going. Um, how have you managed that? I think um, just separating sympathy from empathy, just making the, you know, just learning the difference. And then also um, using that empathy uh, as fuel not so much as like feeling hopeless, using it as fuel to say, hey, no, esto no va a pasar para la otra vez. We're going to keep pushing forward. We're going to push bills. We're going to do everything we can to avoid the situation. Kind of having a uh, like a five minute pity party and moving forward has been like my biggest thing. Just, you know, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay. It's, it's terrible to see, you know, I had people sending me like, sadly, I had people sending me from our community, um, like people, you know, um, just like they, rec you know, how our community, they, they record everything. And there was people that sent me videos of people that were deceased and they were burned. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot. So, um, kind of learning to set boundaries of what people, you know, what, <laughs> what I'm willing to see and just kind of, um, yeah, again, using my empathy as fuel, just moving forward and balancing my life going to the beach a lot has helped. <laughs> um, and then again, you can never really turn it off, which is kind of, it's, I guess it's the beauty because it, it fuels the passion, but um, kind of just using everything I'm seeing as fuel to advocate. That's, I guess that's how I'm balancing. <laughs> that's a great, still question. working on it. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's hard. I'm still working on it. It's a huge jump, but I think I'm doing a lot better. Um, but yes. <laughs> Can you, can you tell us what resources are available for the LAPD? Of course. Why? Of course. So um, we, so a lot of people don't know, but Pacific Gateway Center um, has a center here on Oahu. 
Um, they're actually in Honolulu on Umi Street. Um, they offer a lot of resources for immigrants. So they offer shelter, housing assistance, clothing, food, health care. They offer employment um, or in, um, entrepreneur services. Um, the big thing that they offer is immigrant immigration legal services at low cost, which is really, really helpful. Um, they also have a language, a Hawaii language bank. So if you ever need interpreters, they actually have a language bank that you can use. Organizations or businesses can actually use and um, hire interpreters through there. Um, they also have resources. They can refer you to religious or spiritual, um, spiritual. Uh, basically any needs that you have, whether it's religious or spiritual, they can kind of connect you with those spaces. Um, they do a lot of outreach events and interpretation and translation services. So that's a huge one that I wanted to highlight. And they actually have a, um, a Pacific Gateway Center actually has a huge, uh, a brand new office. It's a satellite office on Maui. Um, so right. I recommend anyone on Maui going there, um, especially if they were affected by the wildfires. Are there any events coming up that um, you guys can share? Um, so right now we're working on a COFA um, outreach event. So basically Micronesian community event. Um, we're still working on it, but um, I will definitely keep you updated, Barbara, on any events we have. Um, but sure, for sure. now, yeah. How can people um, find you or, and what, you know, what's going on in the community? Of course. So um, the best way to keep up with us would be our Instagram. Um, I know that you um, I sent you the, the link. Um, so it can possibly be found in the description, but it's H I underscore C I R. Um, and then that's our Instagram. And then you can go on our, our website, which is H uh, Hawaii coalition for immigrant rights.org. Is there anything you want to add before we end this wonderful conversation? What of you course. Say, or <laughs> you... well, I mean, listen, we could keep going. We have, I have like mm -hmm. 25 more questions to ask. We not enough time, which is awesome. So we're definitely going to have to have you back. But yeah, is there anything you'd like to, um, to end with? Uh, uh, we leave the floor to you, Iris. Yes. So um, if anyone watching ever needs any assistance, um, whether if you're Latino, Hispanic, from a different background, um, you can contact us, contact the coalition. Um, we can refer you to the many organizations that we work with and we can, we can get you the help you need. Even if we don't know the answer, we're going to find the answer for you. Um, you're not alone and we're here to help you navigate living in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank that you. Was a, that was so much great information. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yep. This is, um, Thank been you a guys. show. <laughs> With um, Iris Mendoza with HCIR, the Hawaii Coalition for Immigrant Rights. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Thank you for joining us today. And hola y aloha. And thank you to Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Gracias. Aloha. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs>